There will be fewer and fewer jobs that a robot cannot do better. Okay. What to do about mass unemployment? This is going to be a massive social challenge. Um, and I think ultimately we will have to have some kind of universal basic income. A universal basic income is a policy where every citizen in a country gets a certain amount of money, free and clear, to do whatever they want. So my plan, the Freedom Dividend, would give every American adult $1,000 a month, $12,000 a year, starting at age 18. This would create millions of jobs around the country and would allow families and individuals to help manage uh, this historic transition that we're in, in terms of technology transforming uh, the labor force. I do think that a pretty good chance we, we end up with a universal basic, basic income or something like that due to automation. Let's get a sense that you have of um, what you want in, in this country to be. The Washington Examiner, uh, in an interview with them, you said, we need to become both capitalist and socialist in different areas. Yes. Uh, what, what do you mean? You can't be both. Well, uh, so I like to quote my friend Eric Weinstein, who said, we never knew that capitalism was going to get eaten by its son technology. And here in the 21st century, a lot of the economic rules we take for granted have stopped applying. You can build a very successful, profitable company that does not employ many people, and if it does employ people, you don't have to treat them well, you can make them all independent contractors and gig workers. So the things we take for granted have broken down, and we have to start solving this problem by evolving our entire system. So what is it you, that made you run for this? I mean, you're a young dad besides, that's, and you discussed this with your family, what was their reaction? Well, you know, I was talking to my wife about this just the other day in the car, which was like, well, how did that conversation go? Um, but I, as you suggest, I'm a father, uh, I've got two young children, and I'm running because I want to keep this country strong and whole for them. I, I mean, my, I'm the son of immigrants. Yeah. Uh, my family benefited tremendously from the fact that I was lucky enough to be born here, and I want to feel the exact same way about my sons. So were you inspired by Donald Trump getting elected and that that changed the dynamics? Well, it certainly showed uh, what was possible. Um, but as I said at the opening, I believe that the reason why Donald Trump is our president is that there have been these fundamental economic right. changes that have displaced many manufacturing workers, and they were his retail workers. Base. Yes, and uh -huh. the Democratic Party, for whatever reason, is not trying to address those problems. They're attacking Trump himself or the symptoms but the disease is this pervasive economic insecurity as we make it harder and harder for Americans to find meaningful opportunities. So you need to, to get a, a seat at one of these debates. You need 1% or to poll 1%. That's 65,000 uh, individual donors. You're, you've, you're already at both, I guess, right? Yeah, and I'm going to be on the debate stage in June and July. The DNC has already reached out to my team. Is that right? So you're yeah, there. they were so, um, you know, so they, they're very, very... Uh, open this time where they, they want everyone to know that they're not going to put their you, numbers And down. I've done a few of these debates myself for, for both networks and I'm, there's the so-called kids table if you're not at, with a major league. The guys. JV, I remember, <laughs> and the, the Republicans. Is, is it tough to break through that? Because the structure is such that it's very tough. The DNC, Neil, I'm happy to say, they've actually said they're going to avoid the entire varsity JV dynamic. Put you all up there together? What they're doing is they're splitting it into two nights. Oh, okay. And then they're randomly selecting who goes where. So as long as oh, you make the threshold, then you're treated on an equal footing. And because they're trying to, to make it totally fair uh, for each candidate. Joe Biden is sort of like the elephant in the room. Do you think he is for the Democratic Party? Well, I look at the same polls you do, and certainly there are a lot of people that are very enthusiastic about Joe. And I've had this, the, the attitude towards Joe and everyone else, which is the more candidates that run, um, first, the better it is for a candidate like me, because in a fragmented field, <laughs> you know, you can do better Stand with out, like a right. smaller uh, percentage. But I'm also running to try and advance meaningful solutions and improve the lives of uh, working Americans around the country. And to me, if, if other Democrats are adopting my platform, uh, that would be a tremendous win. All of you right now have expensive platforms. A lot of spending in there, Medicare for all, as you said, it, it checks for all. Uh, and a lot of people will scrutinize how you pay for it. Um, and you talk about a value added tax. But in the end, tell me how you're different than your other big spending colleagues. Well, I've been a CEO and business person. I met payroll many, many times. Uh, I believe that small businesses are the backbone of this economy, but we have to face facts where a generation or two ago, maybe someone would have started a hardware store in their main street, but now with Amazon sucking up $20 billion of commerce every year, 
30% of Main Street stores are closing in the next four years. 30% of malls are closing in the next four years. And being a retail worker is the most common job in the economy. So we have to start facing facts. And the entire socialism capitalism dichotomy, again, is out of date and is breaking down. We have to try and take the best of both worlds and build an economy that centers around how people are doing. Take the markets and, and have them allocate resources in ways that would actually help families in Main Street America. You, you speak a Main Street theme, but you're also educated at Brown. You went to Columbia Law. You're smart as a lick. Uh, but some will just go back and say, you know, the guy's just an elitist. Well, you know, uh, I just spent time with a trucker in Altoona, Iowa, and uh, I rode around in his truck um, to, to see what his day-to-day -day life was. Uh, and I wrote a book, uh, The War on Normal People, that breaks down what's going on in main streets around the country. I spent six years working in uh, Birmingham and Detroit and Cleveland. And so showing up in these communities, uh, I just wanted to help. Uh, and I've developed a real passion for helping the little guy or gal. Um, I grew up uh, the only not like the only Asian kid, like a skinny Asian kid who, who'd skipped a grade. <laughs> and so I always felt like I had a thing for the underdog. Um, you know, I'm still a Mets fan to this day, as an example. Well, that's your problem. Isn't yeah, it? I know. <laughs> it, it, it has been a problem. Um, but who's the underdog uh, now in America? It's, it's the mainstream American worker who's getting shoved to the side, and we're just not confronting it honestly. We'll watch you very closely. Andrew Yang, very good having you. Democratic presidential candidate. He took a look around what was going on in the country. He said, you know what? I'm going to do that. It's not an easy process. I don't think we're going to have a choice. Universal basic U income. Universal basic income. I think it's going to be necessary. So it's mean that unemployed people will be paid across the globe. Yeah. Because there is no job. Machine, robot is taking over. Um, that, that's simply the, the, and I want to be clear that these, these are not uh, things that I think that I wish would happen. These are things, simply things that I think probably will happen. Um, and since, and if, they, if, if, if my assessment is correct and they probably will happen, then we need to say what are we going to do about it. And I think some kind of a universal basic income is going to be necessary. Um, now, the output, the output of goods and services will be extremely high. Um, so with automation, um, they, will, they will come abundance. Um, there will be uh, almost everything will get very cheap. Um, the uh, it's, so it, it, I think the, the biggest. I think we'll just end up doing a uh, universal basic income. It's going to be necessary. Um, the, the the harder challenge, much harder challenge, is how do people then have meaning? Like a lot of people, they derive their meaning from their employment. So if you don't have, if, if you're not needed, if there's not a need for your labor, how do you, how, what's the meaning? You, do, you, do you have meaning? Do you feel useless? These are much, that's a much harder problem to deal with. This is not socialism. This is where, this is capitalism where income doesn't start at zero. And if you think about where Americans are going to spend that money, they're going to spend it at their local businesses, their Main Street economy. And this is a great way to help supercharge the, those businesses uh, for the, the next number of years. Less so in underdeveloped countries. But in developed countries, the gap between the rich and the poor is, is increasing. So, for, for example, almost all of the increases in wealth that have accrued to people in the last 20 years have accrued to people who are in the top 1% of the distribution of wealth. And that's not going to stop, by the way. And part of the reason is, is that cognitive power has become even more valuable than it was 40 years ago, and the reason for that is computers, basically. Because if you're really smart and you're good with a computer, you're way ahead of someone who isn't very smart and who doesn't know how to use computers at all. And you're not just a little bit ahead. You're leaps and bounds ahead, and worse than that, you're getting farther ahead all the time. And the reason for that is that computational power keeps increasing, and it increases a lot. It's doubling about every 18 months. So part of the problem that the human race is going to have to face in the next 30 years, along with many other problems, is what are you going to do with people who have neither the cognitive ability nor the conscientiousness to find a niche in society that's actually 
that, that other people will value enough to pay for? Because that's really the question. What do you do? Well, the conservative answer to that is, well, there's a job for everyone. It's like, no, that's wrong. There isn't. And the liberal answer is, well, everybody's the same, so it's just a matter of training. And that's also wrong. They're both, both of those positions are, they're, the scientific research has rendered them permanently outdated. Well, the, the, you know, there is the possibility of providing um, a minimum income. The, the, the question, what will that do, is completely unanswerable. We have no idea what it'll do. You know, and, I mean, it might stop people from, from starving to death, although I wouldn't say in, in North America that's generally not a problem people have anyways. But we don't know. See, I think of it, I think of human beings as pack animals fundamentally. You know, and I, I and I this is just it's a metaphor in some sense. I don't think that people can be happy unless they are burdened down with something. Like a sled dog is burdened down with something. You know, you you have to have responsibilities. They have to be important responsibilities. You have to be sequenced in your time. You know, most of the people I have in my clinical practice, if they're not employed, they just fall apart. And the conscientious ones fall apart because they eat themselves up with shame and, and guilt. And the unconscientious ones fall apart because their sleep schedule goes all over the place. They don't eat regularly, regularly anymore. They do all sorts of impulsive things that are counterproductive. And, you know, they just sort of spiral into a pool of meaninglessness. So... Human beings are pretty social and we're pretty altruistic, you know, in, in some weird manner. And it, it doesn't seem to me that people can live a life that's acceptable if all they have is enforced leisure. So maybe that'll be wrong. If you provided people with a base salary, maybe people would figure out what to do with their spare time. But um, it's, I doubt it. I don't think people are, I think it's very, very difficult for people to regulate themselves in the absence of a certain minimum of, of social structuring and guidance. I've seen very, very few people who can conjure that up on their own and manage it for extensive periods of time. I think I've only met one person, I would say, in my whole life who's actually managed that. And that particular person has a very large array of talents and is extremely intelligent.